pray with me this morning. God, we just come before you with grateful hearts, with air in our lungs as we cry out to the heavens, as in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. God, I just ask that you prepare our hearts today for worship and let us praise you with all that we are. Amen. Please stand and join with us as we worship. We waited for this day. We're gathered in your name. We're calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with you. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're seen. standing with us now oh lord unveil our eyes you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart only how to triumph my God will never fail no my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. 
every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant, because I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. 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 I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good Well, good morning. It's been exciting. Uh, yes, you may be seated. Sorry. <laughs> it's been exciting over the last few weeks to highlight our ministry partners. We started with Tarleton BSM, and then last week we had our own Kayla and Nzatu talking about the seminary that God has led them uh, to develop in Madagascar, when, uh, where Nzatu is from. Well, this week we are talking about Seattle, Washington. As many of you know, the Landing Church uh, I don't want to get too deep into it because Jonah easily will uh, have it on video here. But in 2015, Pastor Chris took a few others to Seattle, Washington, to the Landing Church to serve with Andy Brown as well as the rest of the church members. In 2016 and 2017, we took two different teams, and we went up there to serve as well for a week. 2019 was a year of change. They actually merged with the Awakening Church, and that's where Jonah easily comes in. So I don't want to take up too much time, but if you'll pay attention to the screen here uh, and Pastor Jonah Easley. Thank you. Hey, South Hills. My name is Jonah Easley, and I'm the pastor of Awakening Church in Bellevue, Washington. You know, when the Lord first called our family to the Seattle area to plant a church, we knew that the task before us was going to require an amount of faithfulness and patience like we'd never experienced before. As Pastor Andy Brown began his transition from the Landing Church, God called us to step in and replant what God had begun in this new work called Awakening Church. 
We are constantly asking, how do we take the gospel to people that are far from God in a culture that seems opposed or even apathetic? Although we are swimming upstream, we are committed to reaching our multi-ethnic community with the gospel. Over the past couple years, God has been transforming the hearts of people within our church and across our city. Each week we are engaging multiple uh, groups of people in Bible study and children's Bible clubs and city groups and, and even Sunday worship. We have found that living on mission is not about doing more. It's about doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality. God has called us to enter into people's everyday lives, showing them what a life changed by the gospel looks like. And we want to invite them to come and see and share the gospel that has changed us so much. It's no secret that doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality is costly and risky. It costs our time and it costs us our comfort. It would be much easier to go about our daily lives never engaging people with the gospel, never inviting them into our homes for meals, never listening to their stories and ideas, and never being vulnerable about our weaknesses as followers of Jesus. But as we commit to helping others grow in their relationship with God, we are reminded of our calling to be a good steward of the gospel. Your prayers and your support and equipping have no doubt played an invaluable role in our desire to show and share the gospel of grace in our city. So that every man, woman, and child would have a daily encounter with Jesus. That's our heart. That's no small vision. But listen, we serve a great God. Thank you for your partnership and your passion to walk alongside of us in one of the most unreached places in America. We're excited to continue to serve alongside you as we join Christ in the renewal of all things. For regular updates, you can subscribe at JonahEasley.com. Thank you and God bless. Please in prayer for the Awakening Church. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for this day. Thank you for the Awakening Church and for their work in Seattle. God, I pray that you renew them daily and that they are able to be a light and a refuge for you, God, and that people um, are able to see you within each member. God, I pray that you will bless us throughout this week and bless them, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Please stand as we begin to worship. There's a reason I can sing There's a reason for this life inside me One name above all names Jesus, yes it's Jesus There's a reason for this hope there's a reason for this peace that I know, unworthy of our praise, Jesus, yes it's Jesus. I will lift my hands up, I will raise my voice high, I will shout out your love till the day that I worship I bring. You're the reason I live. You're the reason I sing. You're the reason I live. You're the reason I sing. For the victory over sin. For the goodness of your grace each day. I will bow and bless your name, Jesus, I thank you, Jesus. I will lift my hands up, I will raise my voice high, I will shout out your love till the day that I die. Everything that I have, all my worship I bring, you're the reason I live, you're the
time on earth is through. When my final breath has left these lungs, I'll forever be with you. When the song goes on. church family. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not with you this morning. My family is away spending time with some of our extended family this weekend, but I'm worshiping with you online today. I'm so thankful to have Shay Wood preaching for us today. Uh, Shay has served in student ministry. Shay has also helped two different churches launch their multi-site campuses in recent years, but now he and his wife, along with their three boys, uh, live in Saginaw, just north of here, and they are preparing to plant a church early next year. Uh, I met him recently through uh, Tarrant Baptist Association and their staff as he is working through them and with other churches uh, to launch this church. And he loves the church. He loves seeing the gospel expand in a meaningful way, and he has a great word for us today. So church family, listen up, pay attention, engage God's word, and let's learn together as we worship through the preaching of God's word.
No? There we are. There we are. All right. Hey, good morning. How are you? Everybody good? Hey, you sing through your mask. You can answer through your mask. You all right? Good? Happy? Happy to be here? You're online. I'm glad you're joining us online, perhaps at home. Uh, you couldn't be here today, but glad that you're tuning in. And um, again, as, as uh, Chris said, my name is Shea Wood. Uh, I have a wife, Robin. Uh, we've been married for seven years. This coming August 24th will be our seven-year anniversary. And uh, I can't hardly believe it. Uh, I still feel like we were just dating like three months ago, and now we have three kids. So uh, that happens, doesn't it? Uh, so we have Blaze. He's four. He'll turn five on September 1st. Uh, I think we have a picture up there as well. You can see my wife and kids. They're in the overflow room right now so, so our kids could be here and, and all that stuff. So, But um, Blaze, he's, he's the guy in the blue jacket there, and he's going to turn five on September 1st. Um, is that right? Five? Yeah, five. Wow. And then uh, Colson, he's the little guy there, and he will turn three on August 1st, so coming right up. And then we have on the next slide, you can see our new little guy who wasn't quite there in, in the, when that picture was taken. And he is just over six weeks old. He'll be seven weeks on Tuesday. Uh, his name's Zaid, and uh, we are working on a basketball team. So we'll see if a girl's next or if, if we can fill in that, that, that wing position. So... Um, Really grateful for the life God has given me. I have an incredibly good life. Uh, we've had so many opportunities to do so much. As Chris said, we've, I've gotten to, to launch a couple of campuses for, for a couple of churches. I've got to help plant a church back in college and seminary. And uh, we are excited to be at the point where God has finally said, hey, go. Where you're going to go plant a church and see God do a new work. And we're going to see a faithful expression of God's church through Mercy Hill as we plant that in the Saginaw and North Fort Worth area. So, um, just to tell you a little bit about Mercy Hill and why we're doing that, because it's going to give you some insight as I get to know you uh, over the next few minutes into my heart and what I'm going to be talking about today. But at Mercy Hill, I really have one goal for this church, and that is to help people follow Jesus into a better story for their life. I want to help people follow Jesus into a better story for their life. We have an inc Every single one of us has a story that we are living in. And we get to choose the type of story that we're going to tell with the lives that we live. So that is the heart of our church. And so I just want to ask this question. And I, I don't want to preach so much as just have a conversation this morning. And so you can talk back. It's all right. Uh, I know it's a Baptist church, right? But it's okay. And uh, so I'd love to hear, hear from you and talk back to me this morning as we go through this a little bit. But, but I just want to ask you this question. What are you living for? What are you living for? What is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? A lot of people live for a lot of things these days. I mean, we can just go down the list. People live for a lot of things. They Some people live for the weekend, right? Your 17-year-old, 20-year-old perhaps lives for the weekend. Just can't wait to get till Friday. Monday's the worst. Friday's awesome, right? If, if, if that's how you feel, you, it's a good chance you're living for the weekend. Some people live to work. And you wonder why your husband's never home, because he lives to work. And that's, that's what he's living for. For. Some people live for retirement because security is important. And you want to make sure that when you get to that point that you're going to le be living for retirement. Some people live for family. Perhaps that's you. Everything you do, you live for family. It's the most important thing in the world to you. Again, these aren't bad things. It's just a question. What are you living for? Some people, you know, live through their kids. I was talking with a guy this, just this weekend talking about how, how so many people that he's, he's friends with and he gets to do life with are... They literally live through their kids. Everything they do is to be at the baseball field on the weekends. And, and so they live through their kids. It's, it's living vicariously through their children. Maybe it's you're living for your spouse. Everything that they do is the most important thing in the world to you. Or maybe you live to express yourself, right? That's, that's the millennial desire, right? We want to express ourselves in a new way. We, we want to be original. We want to be creative. We want to have our own YouTube channel, and we are addicted to TikTok, right? Uh, maybe you're, you, you live for Netflix, and just that next season coming out, and you binge Netflix every single weekend. I don't know. Maybe it's to prove someone wrong. Maybe you're living to prove someone wrong, and everything you do is to prove that you really can make it, that you really can do it because of their voice in the past in your life, that you're living to prove someone wrong or how someone hurt you in the past. I don't know what it is that how you would answer that question. Those are just some, some possibilities. But the question is, what are you living for? And I just want to tell you this morning that Jesus has a better story for you. 
Whatever you're living for, as great as it might be, it does not compare to the story that Jesus wants to write with your life. In fact, Ecclesiastes 3.11, I mean, there's something in all of us that longs for more, and it says this, that he's made everything beautiful in his time. I know the world doesn't feel beautiful right now. The U.S. just seems to be torn apart right now. I know things are happening, things are crazy, and, and the world is broken, and, and we need help, right? We are jacked up as a nation. We're jacked up as people. We need, we're not perfect. Still the greatest nation in the world, right? But, but we're not perfect. We, we need a better story. And so I know it doesn't always feel, feel beautiful in the moment, but God's promise is that he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. He's put eternity in your heart and mine. So here's the story that most people live in today. The postmodern story is this. The postmodern story is that is, it tells a story of progress towards a utopia. That if we just work hard enough, if we just do enough, if we just fix enough, then we can get to this perfect world. And it's the idea that, that, hev that earth becomes heaven by transforming earth into heaven. It's, it's working our way up the mountain. Everything about postmodernism is progress, progress, ambition, getting to the next stage. It's, that's the story that our world lives in today. And in that utopia that we look for is really a kingdom without a king. Mark Sayers talks about this in some of his work. He's a pastor and an author, and he talks about how postmodernism, the, the best way to sum it up is that people want the kingdom without the king. What does that mean? Well, our nation, our life is built on Judeo-Christian values that, that for so many, uh, so, so many years, decades, a couple hundred years and longer, uh, that our world has been built on this philosophy of, of things that come from Christianity, come from Jesus himself. Think about it. The idea of equality, who introduced that to the world? I mean, who was the person who actually made that possible to come into the world to the degree that it has? You know who it was? It was Jesus. When he started the church, and, and when Paul would echo this in Colossians where he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but Christ is all and is in all. And so Jesus is the one who introduced equality into the world. And, but the difference is this, is that the postmodern story wants the kingdom, they want the benefits of Christianity without the king, without surrender to Jesus, without having Jesus be a part of and Lord of and leader of our lives. And so that is the postmodern story. Here's a great way to explain it. Anybody seen Peter Pan? We've all seen Peter Pan, right? You can raise your hands, it's okay. We've all seen Peter Pan. And, and the story of Peter Pan, as you know, he's the guy in green tights. It's a little bit creepy, the whole, the whole story. The, the, and in fact, when you were actually, when I was studying for this and learned about the author, it gets real creepy. But uh, that's another story for another time. Um, so so when, you, when you think about Peter Pan, you think about how he lived in Neverland. And in Neverland, you had a few things. There was eternal youth. You never grew up. Eternal youth. You never grew up. There was no authority. There was freedom from authority. They could do whatever they wanted. There was freedom of expression. And if there was authority, like in the pirate Hook, Captain Hook, right, that was the, that was the person to fight against. I mean, this is a really great summary of the postmodern world. There was personal truth, right? Happy thoughts make you fly. It's, it's your happy thoughts, it's your story, it's, it's, it's what, what is true for you is what makes you happy and what allows you to fly and to have an adventure in life. That, this is the postmodern story. This is, the world our lives, uh, this is what our world lives in. This is what people think. That if it's my truth, that it's my happiness, that I follow my heart, that I follow my passion. And even in so much research for business and education, they're learning today that, you know what, uh, finding your passion is not the key to happiness in your life. The key to happiness in life is being passionate about the things God has put into your life. But this is the postmodern story. But there's one more element that nobody ever talks about that you see over and over and over again. And you can see it in the story of Peter Pan, but I'm telling you, you can see it on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and in your students' lives today and perhaps in your own life that there is a loneliness. There's a longing for something more. As much as Peter Pan loved his freedom and loved having no adults around and, and, and all these different things, there was a loneliness. He longed for a companionship with Wendy and he longed for that time with his parents. There was a hole in his heart that he could not fill no matter how great an adventure Neverland was. 
All right, so this is just a great summary of what our world lives in today. But here's the difference. Here's the story Jesus tells. Postmodernism tells a story of progress. You just work hard enough, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. If you just, if you just understand um, whatever it is in our culture that our culture thinks you need to understand with whatever it might regard, whether it's, um, whether it's a, a virus and a pandemic or racial reconciliation or any of these other things that is, is a headline in our newspapers today, the world would say, hey, you just need to change this and this and this about you to see progress in your life and we can together build this perfect world. But Jesus tells a different story. He tells a story that says, no, you can't just build a perfect world with imperfect people. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. And so he tells a story of, not of progress, but of redemption. He tells a story of redemption and towards a new creation. In other words, it's not about working earth up to heaven and climbing that mountain of progress. It is about how Jesus himself, how God himself came down from the mountain to us. How he, came, how he brought heaven to us. In fact, you see this and you repeat this in the Lord's Prayer, don't you? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's about bringing heaven to earth. It's about bringing heaven and hope and change and transformation to people and not about working our way to God. John chapter 1, 14, Jesus says that the, the, the word of God was made flesh and he dwelt among us. He made his dwelling among us. That God himself, Philippians 2, became a man, took on the form of a servant and gave his life on your behalf and my behalf so that we could be reconciled to God. This is the story of redemption. And so the question is, what are you living for? And the next question is, is what is our place in God's story? You have a place in God's story. I have a place in God's story. Your family has a place in God's story. And it's a story that, that we don't settle for. It's a story that we get to be a part of and participate in and aspire to. And so I want to bring us to Matthew chapter 4, where we'll be for the next few moments this morning. In Matthew chapter 4, you can turn your Bibles there or flip on your Bible app or just look at the screen, whatever works for you. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22 is where, where we will be reading. And it says this, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So we see in this story that Jesus is, he's begun his ministry. He's bringing hope to the world. He's setting the captives free. He's doing all, all those different things that you read in the New Testament and in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but what is so important is in, in this moment is as Jesus begins to walk by the sea, and if you read in Luke, it kind of expands the story a little bit. Jesus is actually teaching large crowds, and he steps into the boat with Peter and has Peter push off so he could teach from the boat to the crowds. And at the end of it all, when the crowds are dismissed, he tells Peter, hey, throw your net in. And Peter basically says, hey, we've been, we've been fishing all night, hadn't caught anything. I'm the prof professional fisherman, Jesus. You're, you're, you're a, a religious teacher. I don't think you know about fishing. We didn't catch anything. And Jesus says, hey, do it. So he just says, okay. He throws it over, the, the, over his boat, and he pulls in the biggest catch he's ever seen in his life so that the nets start to break. And that's going to become important as we come to the end of our talk this morning. And so, so, so keep that in mind. And so there's this moment where Peter falls before him and says, you, you are certainly, like, you, you are God. Like, you are, I, I don't know what to do. I'm not worthy to be around you. And Jesus gives him an opportunity, and he says, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. The first point I want us to understand this morning is, is that when, when we follow Jesus, that first part, follow me, it addresses our head, it addresses our decision, it addresses our commitment where we say, yes, Jesus, I will follow you. And so our first point that I want us to learn and to take home today is that a follower of Jesus is surrendered to Jesus. 
Think about those words. Follow me. What does it mean? Jesus, you're the leader. You call the shots. You tell me where to go. Surrendering to Jesus is admitting, believing, and submitting to the truth that Jesus does it better. Jesus does it better. In your life and mine, I'm telling you, Jesus does it better. When you and I try to write our own story, I'm telling you, I don't know about you, maybe you've got it all together. When I try to write my own story, I jack things up really bad. Right? I, I, it just makes life difficult when I try to write my story without God. It, it makes marriage difficult. It makes parenting difficult. I say things to my kids that, that I go, oh my goodness, that was not what God would say in this moment. Right? Uh, it, it makes things hard when I don't allow him to write my story. But Jesus does it better, and surrendering to Jesus is admitting, believing, and submitting to the truth that Jesus does it better. That's our, our goal as we plant Mercy Hill is to help people follow Jesus into a better story. In fact, I just read uh, recently the story of John Newton. I read his biography for the first time in my life, and, and I've always wanted to. You know, John Newton was the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now, I'm, now I see. Even if you're not a Christian, you probably know that song because it is sung around the world at funerals, at events, at all kinds of things, and it has become probably the most famous hymn in history. What's so interesting about this story is that John Newton was a slave trader. He was a British guy who worked on boats and, and sh sailed to Africa to trade slaves. This was his life. And, and he would say things and do things on these ships that, in, 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 to, in order to test God because he was in this battle with God and he would tell you about this in his life and that he would say things that he would, what he would say is he would blaspheme God, he would curse God so much so that even the other non-Christians, the other people who didn't know God on that boat got really uncomfortable. That's how, that's how crazy of a life he was living. And he would come to this point to where a ship he was on got in this big storm, and he didn't know if it was going to make it through, and he called out to God and said, okay, God, you win. If you help me make it through this, I surrender everything to you. You can have the rest of my life. And there was a conversion moment, a change, a transformation in the heart of John Newton. And so that what's so interesting about this is he didn't write this song right after that, that shipwreck. No, John Newton wrote this song 20 years after being a follower of Jesus. Here's why that was so important to me. As you think about the words of that song, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It speaks to every one of us. It resonates in our heart. It pulls something out of us, and it's sung around the world. And what made it so powerful is that John Newton never got over what God had done for him. He never got over it. He never, ever, ever got over it. He understood that God was telling a better story with his life than he could ever tell on his own. And he never got over what God had done for him. Here's my question. Have you gotten over what Jesus has done for you? Has it become old hat? Has it become familiar? Has it become just, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for my sin. Now I'm going to go about my day. Have you gotten over what Jesus has done for you? For you personally, do you really believe that God loves you, that He's present in your life, that He cares for you, that every detail of your life matters to Him, that He knows every hair on your head, that He walks with you in the hard times, that He helps you in, in, in the difficult times, that He has a reason for the pain and suffering in your life, that He has celebrates with you and He enjoys you when you are succeeding and, and when you're having a good time and when you enjoy those mountaintop experiences in your life. That, that, and every single one of those, the highs and the lows, the mountain and the valley, God is there. Have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten the story of what Jesus has done for you? A great summary of, of, of what John Newton understood as the love of God can be found in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And it says this, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. 
He disarmed the rulers and authorities, anybody who could bring an accusation against you to say, you are messed up, you have failed, you have fallen short of who God has called you to be. Anybody who could bring that accusation, he disarmed those people, those rulers and authorities, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, by triumphing over them by going to the cross. In other words, here's the summary. What he's saying here is that when Jesus changes your life, when he brings you into this better story, what has happened to you, what has happened to me, is that we go from dead to alive, from lost to found, from condemned to forgiven, from from defeated to victorious. Are you feeling condemned today by people in your life, maybe by church people in your life? That happens. I mean, let's be honest. Are you feeling condemned by your own past by a voice of, from somebody in your past who is no longer even part of your life today, and yet you're allowing their voice to condemn who you are today? Do you feel defeated today? In everything going on in the world, maybe you've lost your job, or, or, or you've had to take a pay cut, or, or because you've had to stay home in this pandemic, it's brought stress into your family and tension into your family. As you have to spend more time together, and you realize, oh my goodness, I've got to get to know my spouse all over again because I haven't spent any time with them until now. And it's bringing tension and frustration, and you feel defeated because you just don't know what to do different. I don't know what it is in your life that you're feeling, but I'm telling you that when you and I buy into the story of Jesus and what he wants to do in our hearts and lives, he brings us from death to life, condemned to forgiven, from slave to free, from defeated to victorious. And here's the key. Jesus is the one who has done it all. Jesus has done it all, and all we do is walk by faith into a better story. The invitation is open. It's yours to say, yes, I want to be a part of that, but we have to trust him to walk into a better story. John 15, 5 says it this way. Jesus, this is one of his most important and last conversations he has with his disciples before he goes to the cross and dies for the sins of the world. And he says this, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah, but I can bench 260. Yeah, but I, I, I'm a millionaire. I can make a lot of money. Yeah, but I keep getting promoted at work. Yeah, but I'm really talented. Yeah, but I can play some music really well. No, no, no. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing that has any eternal, lasting value. Apart from him, everything we do, everything we say, dies with us. But with him, everything we do, everything we say, every relationship we build, every person we serve, lasts forever. Because God remembers it forever. And he rewards us forever as we trust in Jesus Christ. He's done it all. And so all we do is walk by faith into that story. Brennan Manning says this, the good news means that we can stop lying to ourselves. The sweet sound of amazing grace saves us from the necessity of self-deception. I can accept ownership of my poverty and powerlessness and neediness. That's the good news. You and I can stop lying to ourselves, acting like we have it all together, acting like we're perfect, acting like we've gotten somewhere in life. You probably have. I'm sure you're great. I'm sure you're talented. I'm sure you're, you, you are a very smart person and you can do some great things for yourself and your family. But understand this, that compared to a holy God, we come to the realization that apart from Jesus, we are powerless and needy people. That as much as we can do and accomplish and gain in this world, there is still something longing in our hearts, something lonely without him. And so the second thing that I want us to focus on is the heart, where, G- where Jesus says, hey, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. See, a follower of Jesus is surrendered to Jesus, and a follower of Jesus is changed by Jesus. We are changed by Jesus in our heart. Our perspective of this world is changed by Jesus. Let me say it this way. You do who you are. You do who you are. Now let me be clear. You and I can't do anything to receive God's love on our own. All we have to do is trust him. He's already offered it. He already gives it to us in Jesus Christ. There's nothing we can do to earn God's favor and love and mercy. That's why it's called mercy. 
is because it's a free gift. John 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he says this, hey, if you only knew the gift God had for you, if you only knew. What's she trying to do? She, he, Jesus asks for water, and she questions him. And she says, hey, what, what, what's this all about, right? You really want me to get you water? You're a Jew. I'm a woman. This is an awkward situation. This isn't how things are supposed to happen. What is going on here? And Jesus says, if you only knew the gift God had for you, you would be asking me, and I would give you water that springs up into eternal life. What's this point? Hey, I asked you for water, but it's really not about what you're doing for me. It's about what I can do for you. And if you had any idea of what I had for you, then you would give up any, any, any effort of your own and just say, I need what you have, Jesus. I need what you have. Because you and I do who we are. As God changes us and he transforms us, it will result in behaviors that look different. Not because we're trying to earn our way to God, but because God has changed us. Because we're living from a place of gratitude and a place of victory and a place of freedom that we get to say, you know what, instead of finding stuff that's all about me instead of living for myself, instead of trying to make it ahead, I can live freely. I can give my life away. I can serve other people. I can love them well. A heart is changed by Jesus. Romans 12 says this in verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. To earn your way to God? No. That's not what he's saying. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Your spiritual act of service, your spiritual worship, what is he saying? He's saying, hey, I, I want you to be changed. I want you to offer your body to God. I want you to offer your heart and your mind and your will and everything about you to Jesus so that he can change you because this is the best way for you to give him glory, to worship him, to let him be the leader of your life. And verse 2 says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What's he saying? He's saying you do who you are. If you've truly trusted Christ, you'll love like Jesus. If you've truly trusted Jesus, you'll live like Jesus. If you truly trust Jesus, you'll serve like Jesus. If you truly trust Jesus, you will go into the world and serve people, and share your story like Jesus. Brandon Manning says that a loving God fosters a loving people. That should be the truth. A loving God fosters a loving people. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. See, following Jesus isn't just about fire insurance. It's not just about securing our future it's not just about finding our destiny. It's not just about making life okay. It's not just about having God in our pocket so that anytime we get in a time of need, we can just call on him and say, okay, God, now's your time. I need you. No, no, no. It's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. It's so that he can change and transform us. There's a great meme going around on Facebook right now. Not a meme, but, but like an image, right, where you know, you've probably seen it. That, hey, until we address it, uh, until we change it here, and address it here in our families, in, in our circles of influence, it will never change in the world. It starts with us. It starts with, with what Jesus does in us. Point three is this. We talked about following Jesus. We talked about how he changes us. And we talked about point three is our hands. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This is talking about, okay, now, now what do you live for? What's the better story you're going to tell with your life? See, a follower of Jesus is on mission with Jesus. Now, I know that's kind of a churchy word, on mission. What does that mean? Well, well, it means that he has given us a mission to accomplish. He's given us a job to do. He brings new purpose and new meaning into your life and my life. But guess what? To, to have meaning, if you want to have meaning, if you want to be a person that has meaning, you have to do things that are meaningful. So we have to live on mission with Jesus. What I love about this is Jesus met Peter where he was. It says in Matthew 4, Peter was a fisherman. So Jesus says, hey, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men, right? And so he met Peter where he was, but eventually Peter would begin to see the world through Jesus' perspective. He gave him a new purpose. He told him, he, he, Peter, you're made for more. I've got more for you. See, when we follow Jesus, he leads us to a better story. Here's the deal. We don't need a better Bible study. You don't need a better job or position. You don't need a better spouse. 
You don't need better kids. You don't need a better opportunity. You don't need better Instagram photos. You don't need a better retirement fund. You don't need a better platform for the things that you want to say in this world. No, no, no. What we need, what the world needs, what the world needs from us is a better story. Because until you can answer the why behind the, the, the what, we will never have a story that we're satisfied with. We will never be satisfied with our purpose and the things we're living for. And we often cannot answer the why of our story until we answer the who of our story. It's not just why, what are we living for, it's who are we living for. So if we cannot answer that question clearly, then because of our insecurity, our fear, our story will be written by voices we let into our lives that God never intended to have the pen. Our story will be written by people in our lives. Maybe it's a spouse, a, a boss, a friend, somebody from your past who, who we allow to write our story, but God never intended for them to have the pen. He never intended for your spouse or boss or pastor or a friend or parent or someone from the past to determine your identity and your purpose. No, he says, I want to do that. That's my job. So you do who you are, and who you are is a direct reflection of who you follow. So the question is, who are you following today? Are you following Jesus? Are you listening to his voice in your life? Matthew 13, just quickly, I'll just go through these quickly, just because there's three really great ways we can follow Jesus and what he tells us to do. If we're going to follow Jesus, here's what that looks like. Matthew 13, 14 through 15. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet... You also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. What do we do as as followers of Christ? We serve other people. We serve. We give our lives away. Not just in the four walls of the church, but in every arena of life. What's the second thing we do? Matthew 13, 34, and 35. Later on in this chapter, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I've loved you, you are to love one another. By, all, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What's the key there? We love people. We love people who are not like us. We love people who don't think like us. I mean, if Jesus could get Simon the Zealot, somebody who hated Rome and was willing to kill people to get freed from Rome as, as, as a Jewish man, uh, and, and he could get along with a guy named Matthew, who was a tax collector, who was a Jewish guy who sold himself out to Rome, the people he hated. If he could bring people like that together, then who could he bring together today? Jesus brings the people together who would never otherwise sit in the same room or at the same table. And that's the beautiful thing about following Jesus, is he tells a better story than we would ever tell on our own. Last one is this, Matthew 28, 16 to 20. I'll jump to verse 18, just to start there. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What do we do? We serve, we love, and we go. We leave these walls. We go into our workplace, into our homes, into our our circles of friends, into our neighborhood, into the grocery store, into wherever we go to to go and to share this message of hope that God has given us, to share this better story that God has given us. Because you know what? The people who are not here today, they're looking for a better story too. And I can't tell them because I'll never meet them. But you will. So are you willing to share that story? Are you willing to go to them? See, Jesus gives us his presence and he gives us his power to accomplish his greatest passion, and that's to reach people far from God. See, Jesus is not just in your life just for you. Now, he is. He's there for you, but he's present with you, and he he gives you his strength and his power through his spirit so that we can accomplish his greatest passion, and that's to reach people far from God, to find the one lost sheep, to find the lost coin, to to find that person who needs to hear hope the most. Here's the bottom line of today. When we follow Jesus, he leads us into a better story that changes us and changes others through us. When we follow Jesus, he leads us into a better story that changes us and changes others through us. I'm out of time, so I need to wrap up, but let me just ask a few questions as a heart check. Here's where you get to choose to apply this today. When was the last time that you enjoyed God's presence? That you just sat with him 
You just enjoyed the fact that he loves you. That he's not looking at you saying, hey, I wish you would have done this better. I wish you would have done that better. I wish you would change this. Uh, you're never going to be good enough. No, no, no. When he looks at you, he says, he's not saying any of those things. He's saying, you are a great child of mine, and I love you. When's the last time you just enjoyed his presence? Second question, how is Jesus changing my heart and behavior? Again, it's not just about behavior modification. It's not just about changing what we do. It's about changing why we do it. How is Jesus changing my heart and behavior? Third question, do I love those Jesus loves? I mean, truly. Do I truly love those Jesus loves? Am I willing to be inconvenienced to help others? Do I take time to hear their stories? Do I invite them into my home to share a meal? Do I, do, do I have a weekly rhythm of living on mission with Jesus, letting other people be a part of my life and being a part of theirs who I know they don't know him? They don't have a relationship with him. They're looking for something, but I'm going to be their friend. I'm not going to beat them over the head. I'm not going to force anything. I'm just going to love them and serve them and make it a rhythm in my life to be around them and to have them be around me so that they can see that there's a better way and there's a better story they could be a part of if only they would come to faith in Christ and choose to follow Jesus. See, a story told to yourself alone is not a story worth telling. So who will you share the story of grace with this week? That's the question. That's what I want to leave you with. So here's the challenge. The best training for mission happens while you're on mission. So invite one person to dinner this week who you want to build a relationship with and eventually, when the time is right, share the story of what God has done for you. Begin with prayer. Pray about it. Pray about it with your spouse if you're married. Uh, and, and say, okay, who is it going to be? Ask God to bless that. Share a meal with them. Listen to their story. Laugh, play games. And look for opportunities to serve them. And look for opportunities to share your story. In The Lord of the Rings, if you're nerdy like me and you like that movie, uh, Gandalf the wizard says this, I found that it is the small, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keeps the darkness at bay. Small acts of love and kindness. We get to be a part of a great story. But sometimes the greatest moments and the greatest story are told in the smallest ways, in the smallest rooms. Who will you share the love of Christ with today? Live in such a way that it demands a Jesus explanation. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed for just a moment, I just want you to talk to God for a minute. Just have a conversation with him right where you're at. And there's two people I want to talk to as, as I pray for you and as we wrap up this morning. Um, First group is, is, is maybe you're here saying, you know what, uh, I've trusted Jesus, I love him, but I've not been living out that better story. And I want to give you a chance to just talk to God and say, God, I, I, I want to live out that better story again. God, I've forgotten what you've done for me. I've forgotten how good you are to me. And I want to remember that. And I want to say thank you. And I want to follow you. And I want to do this, Jesus, because I love you. I want to give you the chance to say that to him. And the second group is, is this, that, that perhaps you're, you're more aware of your failures and your hurt than you are of the love and grace of God. And I want you to know you are deeply loved by Jesus Christ. And he is saying this morning that, as he said to the woman at the well, if you only knew the gift God had for you, you can trust him today. You can come to him today. And I want to give you that chance. So, so let's pray. And just remember this bottom line, that when we follow Jesus, he leads us into a better story that changes us and changes others through us. God, thank you for everyone here, everyone watching online, tuning in, uh, everyone who will see this message this week. God, I, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to, to be um, open to what you have for us, God, the story you want to write with our lives. God, help us to follow you and give you control to surrender to you. Help us to be changed by you, God, transformed in our motives and our actions every day, that it's not about us, but it's about what you want to do in us and through us, God. Help us to live on mission with Jesus, to go out into the world around us, and to love people enough to share the good news of Christ with them, God, because anything that we do in those moments can change a life forever. Help us to invite people into God's story by loving them well and sharing what you have done. Give us courage to do that. Help us to do that. Help us to remember what you have done for us and may that light a fire in our hearts and our lives that says, you know what, I want to give this gift to others as well. I want to be a part of what God is doing in this world. I want to be a part of the story of redemption. 
God, for those in this room who, who may not know you, who have never trusted you, who have never decided that, hey, I want to be the friend uh, of Jesus. I want to trust him to save me. I, I want to walk with God every day. God, if they've never made that decision, but they're here saying, I want to live a better story, God, I pray that they would have courage to do that. We love you. We thank you for the chance to trust you, maybe for the first time today, maybe all over again. But God, thank you that we get to trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if, if you are here and you do want to make a decision or talk to somebody, we'll have people at the front and back at the sides who would love to speak with you this morning. Chris wanted to make sure that you knew that. Um, and so feel free to reach out to them. They'd love to pray with you and hear your story and what's going on in your life as well. So glad to be with you today. Oh God, how I need